Welcome to another video. My name is Raul and I'll be guiding you today. Let's get started in integrating PayPal Advanced Checkout. This video is a continuation or part two of the first video called How to Integrate PayPal Standard Checkout. A production PayPal account doesn't have this advanced credit and debit card feature enabled by default. It's an onboarding process that one must apply for and perhaps wait a few days for vetting to be approved for, but you can enable this on your Sandbox REST app that you created. To start this, once again, I'm going to go over the front end markup code, the front end JavaScript code and the back end code, which in my case happens to be JavaScript, but I'll also explain it where you could understand for whichever programming language that you use for the back end. Starting with the HTML code, let's scroll down here. We will find our payment options div that we used in our last video, and you can see it was empty before and now it has a bunch of stuff. I've added a credit or debit card form here. The classes are simply styling, which you can add whatever you want in yours. The important part for how our SDK renders these card forms is that you must provide it placeholder divs that will house the credit credit card fields. Each div must have an identifier that you can provide our SDK. So here's mine, ID equals. You can stylize these divs however you want since they will eventually convert to an input field as well as there are some styling options for the fields themselves in the JavaScript portion that I will show you in the next file. Here are the rest of the card fields represented as divs. Here's the expiration date div, the CVV div. I've also added a real input element, not a div placeholder, but a real input that asks for the user's email and I've made it required. I'll show later on what we could do with this. And lastly, we have a submit input element here to submit this form that I've made. It doesn't have to be a real form if you don't want. It doesn't have to be strictly a submit button. It could be a regular button or an image, or you can implement this however you like, since the JavaScript will essentially take over and make the API calls and trigger the functions that you tell it to. How about we see how this actually looks like in our working example of that NFT website that we started on the first video. So here it is. We see that we've added card fields directly under the main picture and I've added some labels and just the slightest styling. So let's go back to the code. Here I'm switching to the front end JavaScript file. So this will run directly on the browser. This all may look familiar, but after adding the credit card and debit card fields in the mix, there ended up being some repeated functionality. So what I've done is consolidated them and wrapped them into their own functions. I've also refactored a few of the functions that was used in the previous tutorial to make them a bit more scalable. The is user logged in function is very simple and I added it here to show you that you can use something like this for logged in users. You can check if a user is logged in and if so, store that user's unique identifier in a variable that we can use to fetch the client token in the next function. If there is no user logged in, then it'll just save an empty string, which that's what will happen in our situation in this demo. But like I said, I wanted this function to be here so that you can leverage it and expand it to your liking if applicable. Here is one important PayPal related new function. We are requesting a client token from our own server. When I review the server side code, I'll show you which PayPal API to call and how it works. The only thing to note here is that we are passing over to our server that customer ID that I just mentioned, and it will be a part of the client token if you have a previously stored customer credit or debit card method and associate this payment with that customer. We aren't going to go over stored payment methods on this guide. That will be a different video. The display error alert. I had this code going on a few times after I added the credit card field. So once again, I just consolidated all instances. And the same thing for this display success message function. It's long enough where I could just call it from a function. And the only differentiator this time around is that I've wrapped the first name shown here and also the last name to display the names if they exist in the response from PayPal or just to not display anything if they don't exist in the response. For the card payments, you'll notice we aren't asking them for their name, just for the email as the customer identifier. So you won't get that in the card response. And directly under the function where I tear down the PayPal buttons, I will make the credit card fields hide as well, shown right here. Now let's move on to these functions being used in the code. We start here with the is user logged in and all that occurs, remember, it's just a variable gets saved with either a customer ID or a blank string. That sets up the next get client token function 
to use that customer ID in the request. And after the dot then, we get the resulting client ID to be able to use in the PayPal SDK script tag. Here we append a script tag to the head as we did in the last video, and we are passing the usual SRC, the source, which is the URL that we passed in our first video, but this time we're appending a query called components and sending over equals buttons, comma, hosted dash fields. This tells the SDK to load the components, not only for the PayPal buttons, but also the library that powers our hosted credit and debit card fields. As well as we must add another attribute to the script tag called data dash client dash token. Token. That will hold the client token that we requested from our server. That will be used for the hosted fields. If we scroll down and skip some of the older code that we use for the PayPal buttons, I just want to point out this network call where we asked to create an order for the PayPal buttons and also this complete order API call where we capture and complete the payment, they have been adjusted only slightly, but these same exact API calls that you can see that are being used for the PayPal buttons will be the same ones used also for the hosted field. So we wanna use the same ones, at least for this demo. Of course, you can change that up in your own website, but I'm just letting you know that behind the scenes, you are able to use the same processes. As you can see here, after the API call is completed, I'm using the new display success message function and sending over the data that it needs, which will be the details of the resulting order. And also, if you remember, we're going to tear down those PayPal buttons. And at that point, that PayPal underscore buttons variable that we created, it will be out of scope of this function. So I'm just relaying it and passing it over so that it has access to run the dot close function. If we continue scrolling down, I will show you that this is the last PayPal related line that we had in our our previous tutorial. Immediately after that, we will begin our hosted fields code. We will leverage that since we now have the hosted fields component we can run. And now we'll run dot hosted fields and then call the dot is eligible function to give us a true or false if this merchant's PayPal account has the capabilities to even use the hosted fields functionality. The rest of the code will live inside of this if statement. Something that I didn't include in this is an else statement, but you'll want to add that to hide the card fields as they won't do any good displaying them to the front end user if you don't have PayPal Advanced enabled on your account. Similarly to the first video, the hosted fields have their own library of functions and methods. We will start by calling the paypal.hostedfields.render. This render function takes an object of options as its argument, and I'll go through each item now. Starting with the create order item, this will take the exact same create order API call as the PayPal buttons and return the same data, so no need to change anything there. Hosted fields also has its own styles object. Here we see a class for valid and we see that we set the font color to green, a class for invalid, and I wanna set the font color to red in that case, and some styling for the input elements where I've set my own font size and the color to white. Then we have a fields item where we explicitly tell the SDK which divs the secure fields should render inside of. These are those HTML divs that we saw at the beginning of this video. We give it the DOM selector and a few other attributes as well. All the documentation to the full list of attributes will be listed in the description for you to review. After the dot then, we get a new library or object of functions that the SDK binds to the credit card field and other data that we just fed it. I called it card underscore fields. We're going to use one function to submit all of this a few lines down. But first, I will add an event listener to the card form itself. And this is where I change the text of the button to say loading and I disable it from being clicked again. Then I'll use the card underscore fields and run a a dot submit function to tokenize everything that the user has typed out in the card forms. A quick note while I leave this key blinking inside of the submit function, as you can see, I'm currently not passing anything. I'm not even passing an empty object, it's just blank. That works for my demo, but you are able to pass an object where you can send customer data for the card info if you need it. This is info like cardholder name and billing address. I'll add it to the example in the GitHub repo so you can play around with it, but for my example, I'm not passing any of that now. Once you submit it, the data that customers have entered in the secure hosted field gets tokenized and appended to the order. Now we can run our complete order API call. Once again, it's the same API call that we called for the PayPal buttons. Notably, the only difference is what you see here. I passed the email address given by the user. This is so you can do follow-up via email or add it to your system if you need to. I'm passing the order ID and email and displaying a success message. Finally, let's take a look at the server side code. As outlined in my first video tutorial, I'm currently using Node.js as my server-side environment. For starters in this code, I mentioned earlier that you could collect the email address of a cardholder to send them an email receipt if you wanted to develop that yourself outside of PayPal's APIs. 
So I'll be doing that today just as an example, and I'll still be using REST APIs. I've used SendGrid to send these emails in this code. For security reasons, you'll get certificate errors if you try sending out SendGrid API calls and working in local hosts. So I'm adding this one line that is node specific to override any self-signed cert errors. You may or may not have to do that in your environment when using SendGrid. If you don't wish to use SendGrid to send emails, just disregard this and remove this line altogether. All the other variables below that we already covered in the first video, so I'll continue below and we see this create order route. This was created in the first video, so that will stay intact. Let's scroll down and now we have this complete order endpoint. This was also created in the first video and as you can see, the only change that I made was that after the API call gives me a successful response, I'm grabbing the response that is represented here as the variable called JSON and if the ID is included in the object, then for sure a page PayPal transaction has been created and the payment has been captured. In that case, I will want to send an email. Once again, if you're skipping this whole email sending portion, then remove the lines that you see in this video of 131 through 133. Just as you see them in this video here, in the GitHub files, the lines may be different since I add more comments and stuff in the final file. So use this video as a reference of what to remove if you won't be doing this email portion. Now let's take a look at a brand new PayPal API call that is important to our hosted fields. We want to generate a client token that will be a part of the front end JavaScript SDK tag as an attribute to uniquely identify the purchaser. As you can see here, we will pass the customer ID in the body payload only if it's applicable and otherwise if the string is not populated, it'll just be null and we'll pass it in the body request anyways, but it won't interfere with the API call itself. Then it's just the standard REST API call and when we get to the JSON response, we'll isolate just the client token and send it as a string to the browser shown here. That's really all there is to the new endpoints. Now I'll go over for the folks who will be leveraging the SendGrid function here. You'll populate your SendGrid API key here. And in this variable, I already have a lengthy HTML email template pre-populated that will be primarily static. But in my code, I've passed some data in the transaction argument here that I've labeled as object. And if I scroll down and examine this SendGrid specific object for the API request, I'm also using the email in the to field for who to send this email to, it will be the email that the purchaser provides on the browser. Below here from the from email, I've put anything just like my company at email.com. But of course, you'll want to add yours. And lastly, we run the API call. And as you can see here, I'm actually not really doing anything with the response. I'm just logging it in the server, but not sending it to the browser or anything. So I'm just keeping it simple. And if the email sends, then it sends. If not, it'll just log it and it'll tell you why. Down here, you can see that I placed a send email with send grid end comment so that you can start from the top here in the begin comment and completely remove just this whole function if you aren't planning on using this SendGrid function at all. Since PayPal will not send emails to customers who choose to pay with their card, as opposed to paying with PayPal, where in that scenario, an email from PayPal would be expected from the purchaser. All right, that was a lot of explanation to go over. So let's go ahead and do the fun part and just run all of this. I'm going to boot up my server once more by doing node index and go to my browser. I'll refresh this localhost and here we are. As you can see, the new credit and debit card form is showing here. We have labels and placeholders and the security code card number and expiration date labels and everything that I showed in the HTML. We have the email input here and we have our purchase button. Below we still have our PayPal buttons that we built in the first video. It's important to note that by now the front end JavaScript has already ran and rendered these credit card fields. So they aren't divs anymore. They have been populated by PayPal's secure iframes that will do the intake of the customer typing out their card info so that your website doesn't need to handle that. We can use the default test card of four and then type out 15 number ones for a total of having a 16 digit visa test card. And so here the buyer would actually put their email. So let me just retype. And now I'll click purchase. It's loading and running both the PayPal API calls and the SendGrid as well. Here we are. Here's the thank you message. As you see here, there are no first and last names since it was not a PayPal payment and I didn't ask for that info. Also down at the bottom, both the PayPal buttons and the card fields are all gone, not displaying, and we have a successful card payment. That's the advanced checkout implementation in action. Now, for those who used the SendGrid option, let me switch over to my Gmail and show you what you will receive in this demo code. 
Here we are and we see the subject line. I'll open it and perfect. This is a simple template and thank you message that includes a unique PayPal transaction ID here. That's great. I'll scroll down some other info, your own buttons. And here is that image that I added and it all looks good. Well, that does it for this video. Thanks for hanging in there until the end. And you'll find all of the code with some additional comments as well as the GitHub link in the description. We have now successfully integrated PayPal Advanced Checkout.